All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, this is going to be our third panel for today, and Costantino is the first of our three speakers. Uh, Costantino Oliva is a PhD student, he's almost done, at the Institute of Digital Games, University of Malta, and where he's also an assistant lecturer. Um, his field of interest is music and sound in video games, and I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thank you. Can you close the door? Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, as Stefano just mentioned, my name is Costantino Riva, and I'm from the Institute of Digital Games at the University of Malta. Um, this paper, uh, what I'm going to do in this paper is finding musical actions and looking for uh, what is the status of musical action in digital games, what should be there in order for an action to be called musical within the context of digital games. Uh, in order to do that and to find what this musical action can possibly be, um, I will be reviewing quite different pieces of literature from game studies to the different fields and subfields of musicology. Um, and following that, I'm going to give you two examples of musical action in digital games uh, that are, in my opinion, completely different in between each other. So I would like to start by presenting an early example uh, that I guess we should be all familiar with. Uh, Super Mario Bros. and the musical qualities of Super Mario Bros. In the literature about this specific game, um, we found different analyses, both of what can be understood as the background music of the game, uh, and of, again, what can be understood as the sound effects of the game. Uh, Sharpman writes, with reference to uh, the overworld theme, that this theme features a chord more reminiscent of a jazz classic or WC prelude than a video game track. So basically, he talks about the music that is found in digital games, the music that is found in Super Mario Bros., and analyzes these pieces of, mu this piece of music. Uh, Wallen, on the other hand, focuses on the jump sound uh, and says Mario's leap has a pleasant sound. It does not use minor or diminished intervals because a typical game player will likely hear the same sound repeated hundreds of times. So both of them actually find musical, quali musical qualities in different parts of the musical, out the acoustic output of Super Mario Bros. And I would like you now to focus on this jump sound because I want <coughs> to present an example from my own musical activities within Super Mario Bros. This is something that I used to do when I was a kid and I redid it in order to present it to you. So this is me playing Super Mario Bros. Oh yeah, I should do this. Can you hear it? Yeah. Okay, so of course I'm playing Super Mario Bros. Listen to the jump sound, please. So at some point I start jumping on the spot. And then I'm like, I'll do it again. I just disregard anything that is happening and I jump on the spot. I don't really care about what is happening within the game. Now I die, that's fine. And eventually I will do that again. This time around though, I'm actually able to get the mushroom. So I become bigger. If you can hear it, uh, the sound is now different. That doesn't really matter. But it allows us to appreciate something. Again, I do the same thing. And I start jumping again and again and again. Now, if you focus on the jump sound, uh, what Wallen had said about it is that it was, it was pleasant. Uh, we should call this kind of sound a glissando. What I was doing here uh, is, when I jump constantly, actually, I do not let the chip of the NES uh, get to the final part of the sound. So it goes like boing, and when I start jumping on the spot, it goes like boing, 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 and I effectively cut the final part of the jump thus creating something that was not specifically coded by the people that actually did the game. Uh, so I thought that this could be a form of mischievous musical action. Uh, Yaroslav talks about mischief makers, uh, players that take advantage of the capacity of video games for comical effect. This was my intention. I will do this for my sister, and I will like, call my sister and tell her, look what I do. 
Uh, Flanagan, on the other hand, talks about critical play, uh, which is a form of playing that questions an aspect of play scenario function. Somewhat I will describe my actions within these two definitions, but mine had to do, of course, with the acoustic output and actually with the musical qualities, I believe, of this acoustic output. So how can I do something, categorize, analyze this form of musical actions, and are there different forms of musical actions? Um, to do that, let's do a step back. We are all familiar with Arset. With Arset. Uh, I think that uh, within game studies, there are different paradigms, uh, one of which is definitely the text paradigm. As Arset writes, games became subject to humanistic study only after computer and video games became popular. These digital games, unlike traditional games or sports, consist of non-ephemeral artistic content, crucially for us, sounds, right? Storage sound, words, sounds, and images, which places the game much closer to the ideal object of the humanities, the work of art. Thus, they become visible and textualizable for the aesthetic observer in a way that previous phenomena were not. So, it seems that what happened within the subfield of game studies that goes by the name of maybe ludomusicology or the study of sound and music in digital game actually did something similar. Uh, and that is, I find various examples of uh, papers and researchers that find the musical text within the main digital game text. And this is quite explicit in a few references. Wallen himself, for instance, says that by video game music, so he defines video game music, I generally mean the parts of the soundtrack and I highlight soundtrack, that are pre-composed and recorded for playback to accompany specific locations or events in the game. Uh, similarly, Eggenfeld, Smith, and Tosca writes, music is the soundtrack to the game. So the idea that music is a soundtrack, that music is something that is on a track and that proceeds in a more or less linear form. Uh, but of course, this musical text has different characteristics. And other researchers told us what these characteristics could possibly be. Uh, Collins, for instance, talks about adaptive audio uh, and says, an example of adaptive audio is Super Mario Bros, where the music plays at a steady tempo until the time begins to run out, at which point the tempo doubles. You might be familiar with this. It's when and the music doubles. Um, Kai is even more explicit in this regard. He says, a piece of music can be split in, in digital game. A piece of music can be split into smaller pieces. For example, a verse and a refrain. It should also now be easy to see the correspondence between phrases, verses, refrains, and so on in music, and nodes in hypertext. And this is exactly how dynamic music is often built. Small pieces of music are put together to form a hyperstructure. Now, if that is, I believe, correct, in order to address how music in digital game is composed. So to talk about one specific musical action, composing for digital games. Yet, I think that calling music in games a form of hypertext, and specifically adaptive or dynamic music in games a form of hypertext, somewhat underestimates the cybernetic characteristics of the game itself. So in a sense, the ergodic effort that the player might put into this digital game. So I looked for other references that might allow me to find an answer for what is a musical action in digital game and are there musical actions in digital games. And I had, of course, to look into musicology. And it turns out that even in musicology, uh, the problem of addressing the text versus the problem of addressing activities uh, is actually deeply felt. Um, most telling, I, I actually brought different uh, references from musicology, both within uh, musicology itself, or ethnomusicology, or philosophy of music, um, and those are some of the most telling, and especially small, the very first quote. Uh, he says, musicology is, almost by definition, concerned with Western classical music, while other musics, including even Western's popular musics, are dealt under the rubric of ethnomusicology, and this for small is a big issue. Uh, the word music becomes equated with works of music in the Western tradition. So basically what he's saying is a radical criticism to musicology. He says musicology supposedly should be concerned with music, but it turns out 
that is only concerned with a segment of music. Uh, not only that, uh, actually, it's only concerned with works of music, with musical composition. So he says, musicology equals music with works of music. And he says there should be a difference in that. Uh, from the angle of ethnomusicology, Blaking actually gets to similar conclusions. Uh, music, he says, is more modest, modestly redefined as a system of musical theory and practice that emerged and developed during a certain period of European history. So in these accounts, uh, the theoretical tools that, that musicology has at its disposal uh, are not uh, applicable to other forms of music that are, for instance, not so based on concept of, like composition. And the biggest example of all of this is the concept of improvisation, a musical form that is not by definition based on composition. So where do uh, improvisation sit within the frame of musicology? That is an open question for Small and Blaking. Specifically in philosophy of music, uh, we also find similar uh, concerns. Alperson Vleit writes that Anglophone philosophy of music has seen music as an aesthetic practice centered on the creation of objects, musical works of art. The view tends to favor an approach featuring the inspection and analysis of the aesthetic properties of the musical object and to correspondingly neglect questions about the social, political, and cultural aspects of musical practice. I find this quote particularly telling because it somewhat echoes uh, what Arset uh, has said uh, back in 2003 and that I quoted before. Uh, the idea that we seem in uh, the large degree, the large family of humanities to be of course concerned uh, with finding the work and understanding the work of art and this can be problematic within both fields, musicology or game studies. So in order to solve this issue, uh, musicology has actually already produced a few theoretical tools. Uh, or at least critical thoughts. Uh, the concept that I'm going to use in order to understand musical action in digital games uh, is largely this one, musicking, the idea of musicking. Uh, Small defines music as a verb rather than a noun. So he says, to music is to take part in any capacity in a musical performance, whether by performing, listening, rehearsing or practicing, by providing material for performance, composing, or by dancing. And as such, he considers music not a thing at all, but rather an activity. Uh, and I found this quote particularly telling, because if music is not a thing at all, but rather an activity, it turns out that the entire study of music in digital games is not about finding the thing, finding the musical work and analyzing it, but rather finding these musical activities. Uh, so if we should apply music into digital games, the en entire musicology of digital games should be a musicology of the musical action uh, in digital games. Now, of course, uh, different examples of musical actions are somewhat um, clear, um, more evident than others. Uh, and other authors actually already uh, have done so, already have looked at musical actions in a way, in different forms. Uh, I think that one of the others that I, that I found most useful for me uh, is definitely Kiri Miller. And she wrote a lot, in fact, about ethnography of digital games. So rather than looking at the object of digital games, looking, looking at the communities playing uh, digital games um, with reference to music. And she already defined uh, what kind of performance or activities or actions um, players of digital games might be doing while playing these highly musical digital games. For instance, speaking of highly musical digital games, uh, Guitar Hero or Rock Band. Those examples seem some problematic. Uh, in Guitar Hero and Rock Band, of course what you're doing is somewhat musical. We mimic uh, uh, common instruments and somewhat we are triggering music and we are intertwined with music. Uh, but Miller goes more in detail and says, 
Guitar and Rock Band let players put the performance back in recorded music, reanimating them with their physical engagement and adrenaline. Players become live performers of pre-recorded songs, a phenomenon I refer to as schizophonic performance. Now, uh, when talking about schizophonic performance, we are actually triggering in a different kind of uh, theoretical tool, yet, once again, that I feel the need to sort of briefly introduce. Uh, because schizophonia has been introduced by Schaffer in the field of soundscape studies, and it serves to indicate the split between an original sound and its electroacoustic reproduction. Meaning that we now live in a world, uh, after the introduction of recording technologies, we now live in a world in which a sound event can be detached from its original uh, nature, cause, and moment. And I can record a wind of shattering and then do a recording of a wind of shattering and play it somewhere else. Uh, it originally implies a negative connotation, though, schizophonia, as it serves to dramatize the aberrational effects on this 20th century cultural development. He says that we are now in a schizophonic world, where all these sounds detached from their original nature are reproduced in various different ways, and this might somewhat confuse us, or even uh, be the cause of acoustic pollution. Now, the schizophonic performance that Miller introduces uh, is indeed um, a very interesting uh, point, but I think that we can refer to schizophonic performances as, uh, and by that I mean performances that have to do with pre-recorded sound, uh, really with many other different things, such as DJ performances, or even karaoke. Uh, what is in digital games? What is that makes these performances specific? I think that we again have to look back at the ergodic uh, paradigm and consider the fact that this schizophonic performance in this context of Guitar Hero serves to traverse a text. So the text comes back um, and we could talk possibly of ergodic schizophonic performance uh, in order to tackle this kind of musical action. Uh, so with regards to musicking, of course, this is a form of musicking, uh, and of course, these players are partaking in um, a musical performance of sorts uh, that sees them as more or less evident performers. Uh, but, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, um, I will present in disparate examples. This one was the example that I believe is the most evident one, in which is it's easy to see musicking happening in there. Uh, this might be uh, less obvious, and for this reason more telling. Um, specifically, I talk about musical action in digital games and their relations in between with uh, adaptive musical works. This is an example from Breath of the Wild, a game that comes back. In Breath of the Wild, there is adaptive music. Uh, so, for instance, when I go next to monsters or hobgoblins, uh, a specific uh, music uh, work gets triggered, and I listen to the music associated with that. Uh, these are sort of signaling meanings. Um, Collins, and especially Jorgensen, and also Grimshaw and Garrett, talked about the extraterrestrial space and the player actions. So they talked about how this is a sense, in, sense, uh, in a sense, breaking the extraterrestrial space. So this music that should ideally be situated in the extraterrestrial space. Uh, in reality, causes uh, implications on the diegetic plane. I'm not going into detail about if diegesis is, is uh, applicable or not in here, uh, but what I want to talk about instead is that, in that case, you as the player are effectively triggering a musical part, and as such, uh, you are part of a musical performance that is happening uh, in course of play. Uh, this might be not immediate, but again, looking back at small uh, and considering what musicing is, uh, helps us understand why. In fact, the verb to music, and I'm quoting, is descriptive, not prescriptive. It covers all participation in a musical performance, whether it takes place actively or passively, whether we like the way it happens or whether we do not, whether we consider it interesting or boring, constructive or destructive, sympathetic or antipathetic. In other words, it is not necessary for a musical performance to reach a certain degree of complication of cultural importance in order to be considered a musical performance. If music is inactive, is in action, then this example has to be placed within the music framework. 
So to conclude, the musical work, as we've seen with many others, is not the base ground of music in general. And it turns out that we do music with digital games. We take part in processes that ultimately lead to music. Our awareness of that does not matter with classifying this as musicking. Uh, we, however, are not exactly musicians, composers, dancers, or listeners, or even performers as such. Uh, but we seem to be somewhat a new form of musical actors. Uh, I see further developments for this. This is part of my PhD work. Uh, and I did not mention here, for instance, the relation in between musicking and play studies, how musicking and play crisscross with each other. And I didn't mention uh, things that might be similar such as indeterminate musical text, uh, composition that, are, that have degrees of indeterminacy, or most importantly, improvisation, which is the quintessential actu active uh, musical action that does not have to do with musical composition. However, I believe that with this, I started introducing the concept of musical actions, and hopefully, uh, I hope that this can be helpful, for, can be a contribution to this conference with regards to action. Thank you. Thank you, Constantino. Um, do we have questions for him? Pavel? Just a small thing. Uh, when I was thinking about this example of Zelda, where you switch tracks because they are tied to different actions in the game, would you say that uh, it is kind of like DJing more than performing? Like, we, the player is like a DJ because it changes the tracks. Uh, yes, in a way. As you can see, I. As you can see, this paper is called On the Ontological Status. So I'm starting to build uh, material to eventually that leads to an ontology. And I do believe that this may be the case, that the schizophonia uh, has introduced different ways of uh, musical action. Uh, so yes, we can think about it as someone that is DJing, someone that is in a way interacting with musical uh, materials. Uh, but of course, DJing implies a degree of, um, th there are some qualities in DJing, uh, while in this sense, instead, there are not. Yet, I think that th the reason for why this is worth the, the Zelda example is specifically, it is exactly that, um, that it fits within the music in concept, as in, it doesn't matter if you're a good player or not in order for it to be music. It doesn't matter if you're playing something that is belonging to a certain culture or that has a certain degree of complication in order for it to be music. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I would like to address um, what I saw as a slight slippage between sound and music and to see how you address this. But it was interesting you used the term glissando to describe the jump sound, typically in Mario, typically not expected to be a musical sound. And I know that there's Ian Bogus writes about Proteus as essentially a radio. That you walk through and you tune Proteus to, to play a song for you and you leave it you know, on the computer. Mm. But to take a typical uh, 3D you know, first person shooter game without the music, would we consider the gunshots, the reloading, the footsteps music or soundscape? And your references too seem to slip between musicology and soundscape studies. So do you consider these two things? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so for this presentation, I've actually steered away of the problem of defining what is music and what is sound effect. Uh, so it's good that, that you ask, so I have the opportunity to talk about it. Um, essentially, it is not uh, easy to assign extra musical value to composite sounds. Uh, the concept of extra musical value, extras in, of course, outside of music. So this sound does not belong to music. Has been debated by, for instance, Douglas Kahn in Noise Water Meat. And the way I usually use it in my work uh, is compatible with musicing. So in order for it to be called music, it should not belong, for instance, to uh, the system that we called fine-tuned, ben temperato in order for it to be music. Music that is, for instance, of different origins, say, Persian music, 
or uh, South African music that is made uh, without, of course, pertaining to the system that we are used to, the, see, the, the fine-tuned system, is, of course, music. Uh, and then again, uh, music uh, that is, for instance, electronic music, and that disregards, again, the, the semitone as the final, the, the most simple, the, the most basic um, element of music, is of course music. Noise music is of course music even if it's, it seems to contradict. So I don't really find it helpful, all of this discussion to say that, I don't really find helpful to distinguish in between music and sound effects. As long as uh, sound is composed, I believe that it can be assigned musical value. And uh, the examples that I've chosen here are actually very unproblematic. The one that you were saying, for instance, an FPS, if you remove the music, etc., is slightly more, uh, but the examples that I picked here are somewhat safer because all, there's always a composition that is highly discernible, and as such, uh, it's easier to talk about music in this regard. I think he was before. We have time for both of you if you're short. Great. Thank you for a great, really great talk, and I'm, uh, the first thing, I'm not a game researcher, I'm a music researcher, so That's good. <laughs> it's from my, from my perspective, and my question is, uh, maybe really naive, but if you treat game like a Mario as a potential music work, musical instrument, or a performance, musical performance, what is the source of sound? Hmm. Uh, maybe I should ask you to elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, when you put on the table the uh, games with uh, instruments, like pads, there's always a question, what is the source of the sound? It's not this instrument, it's just, you know, controller. Without nothing at all, it's not real instrument. It does not make sounds. The game makes sounds. But we pretend that it's, it's the main uh, distributor mm. of the sounds. As uh, other games that are not musical games, but have uh, soundtracks. What is the sound? What is in this uh, ontological order the the source of sound? If we are making the game musical instrument or work or just you know performance. Yes. Um, well, uh, I have a more elaborate question on what is the source of a sound. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we should talk. Uh, possibly there is the acoustician as well to that, mm -hmm. uh, which will identify where are the sound waves, mm -hmm. or maybe there is. Uh, the phenomenological aspect of all of this that uh, should ask us to the question where is sound located? Mm -hmm. Where is sound? And eventually, how, where was it generated? I mostly refer to uh, the framework called, a framework called sonic virtuality that essentially says that uh, recognizes sound uh, as a phenomenon that happens within the human brain, and that's where sound is ultimately located. Mm -hmm. uh, a sound wave, of course. If, it, if a sound wave is never decoded by a pair of ears and a brain, it can be an animal, that sound wave remains a sound wave and never actualizes itself as a sound. Uh, this is the general framework that I apply. Um, and with reference instead to digital games, of course there's different aspects. For instance, it's interesting for me to note how the, architect the internal architecture of machines produces sound in different ways. The NES is an interesting example, really vintage consoles are interesting because they actually synthesize. So we are not talking about sampling, mm -hmm. uh, rather we're talking about actual synthesis. Mm -hmm. I, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I have the impression that perhaps a more profitable discussion between the two of you can happen outside of this discussion, but yes. I, it's really fascinating. Um, I don't think we have time for uh, a, a last question, but uh, also Daniel, like they, they have offices one next to the other, so they can come <laughs> uh, apart from here. So um, join me in thanking Constantino once again. Thank you. Thank you.